So the other day, I was a pirate. And I was working with another pirate, pirate or Captain Tagus. And what we had to do is we got a big pile of treasure and we got to get the treasure from the desert island and we got to transport it across the sea. So Captain Tagus built a pirate ship and then together we tested it out, see how much treasure it could hold uh, and got it across the sea safely. And this is my job. Uh, <laughs> So I was a high school, um, secondary school teacher. I was a head of science before I did this. Um, and both this job and that job have both emphasized to me over the years that I just love teaching science. I absolutely love it. It's awesome. And it's awesome for lots of different reasons. But I get to pretend to be a pirate and make up cool stories where kids are playing the game, but they're also learning science and maths and engineering without really knowing it, because no one's told them, because they're just moving the treasure. <laughs> and. Um, also, it's just amazing because everyone loves science. It's, it's just a fascinating subject. I get to show kids things, and they go, no way. How does that work? And I go, I don't know either. Let's find out. <laughs> and it's, it's a phenomenal experience. So I was gutted recently when I read this. And it's a story. Schools put science into the too hard basket. It's a story about secondary schools increasingly making science an optional subject for those kids that are around 16 years old. So right at a point in our history when we've got more scientific and technological challenges than ever, we're making it optional to become scientifically literate, which is almost the same to me as making it optional to be able to contribute to society. And the excuse is that our science courses are too hard, so um, let's, let's let kids choose something that's more suitable to their intellect. Well, I'm here today to tell you science is not too hard for anybody. <laughs> Look at these guys. <clears throat> So, so science isn't too hard because it's emotionally connected to every single one of us. We love to worry about global warming and obesity epidemics. We worry about all kinds of stupid science. And we get excited about it, too. We get excited when people make new discoveries. Um, in Auckland, we're really excited at the moment because someone's invented a, a, a light-proof milk bottle, and it's making our lattes just that little bit sweeter. It's awesome. <laughs> and, so science is there, it's in our lives all the time, we love to talk about it, it's not too hard for anyone, but unless you're the sort of person that likes to memorize heaps of facts, apply scientific concepts to imaginary situations, and practice your measuring skills, science in school might be hard. A Couple of years ago, there's some Christchurch teachers and I here, um, we met this guy in the middle with the red tie on, he's called Professor Barry Marshall. Some of you may know him, he's pretty famous, he invented the cure for stomach ulcers. I don't hear about those so much anymore. So stomach ulcers used to be put down to stress. And this guy said, no, it's, a, it's a, a bacterial infection. But nobody trusted him enough to allow him to do a human trial. So he um, took some bacteria from one of his patient's stomach, made it into a little drink, and drank it, and gave himself a stomach ulcer, and gave himself a human trial. So he then treated himself with antibiotics and found that he could then, first of all, cured 90% of stomach ulcers. Uh, not only that, he'd also won the 2005 Nobel Prize for Medicine. It's kind of cool. Um, and also, he'd um, saved nine billion US dollars a year that was spent just in the US on treating the symptoms of stomach ulcers, not actually the stomach ulcers themselves. It's a pretty phenomenal discovery. And I think this is a really interesting story that we should be sharing with our kids because it's an example of someone not believing the teachers, not believing people who say they've got all the facts and know everything. This is a guy that said, no, sometimes you can't find the answer on Google or in a book. You have to go and discover something new that's never been around before. This is, I promise, the last Nobel Prize winner quote type thing I'm going to do today. But Pearl S. Book once said, the young do not know enough to be prudent, and therefore they attempt the impossible and achieve it generation after generation. If that's not a sentiment we need to tell our kids now, I don't know what is. Because they're going to have to go out and discover new stuff all the time. And so they need to realize that the answers to stuff aren't necessarily always in the classroom. They're sometimes in here and through the experiences they have. So I guess I'm saying that we need to bring discovery back into the science classroom. We need to give the kids opportunities to discover new things. Now, they do experiments. And there's loads of them. And a lot of them are really useful. But very few of them actually have an unknown outcome. Very few are new to science. Well, and I don't really understand why we don't have kids doing new to science type investigations. They don't have to go to the Large Hadron Collider. They don't need an electron microscope. They could go out and measure how much force the first 15 scrum can exert against the scrum machine and then try and make it better. <laughs> they could 
they could uh, do what Tejas did. He created a pirate ship, and no, no scientist or engineer has ever been in to measure how much treasure it could carry. <laughs> That's a new discovery, new to science. <laughs> so it's really, really not that difficult. Um, to me, teaching kids concepts like Newton's laws and teaching them how to measure stuff and analyze data is almost like, well, if you do all that stuff and you never give kids opportunity to make a discovery for themselves, it's almost like teaching a kid to paint and then telling them they're never allowed to create their own masterpiece. Teaching a kid to paint and say, you have to copy other paintings now. Well done. It's the same thing. When kids do get the opportunity and the constraints are lifted and they get to discover stuff, they do immense things. A young man came into um, my place of work a couple of weeks ago. It's called Vandan Patel. He's 15. And he's telling me that a couple of years ago, he watched a story on the news about the Pike River mine and how they'd not got a robot to go in to check the place out before the recovery team could get in. So he said, um, I didn't understand why we had to wait for one to be sent from Aussie. So just like any good Kiwi, I went in the shed and built one. <laughs> this is his about fifth or sixth version. It's phenomenal. And it basically, it's got loads of sensors and a camera. You can drive it in places where humans can't or shouldn't go. And it sends data back so they can figure out what they need to do next. It's absolutely amazing. And this is the sort of thing that kids can do when they do really excellent stuff. Not just excellence as a good mark in a test. Excellence as this is not an end point. This just gets more excellent. And, and that's what this kid does. He, 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 he's not stopped. This is like fifth or sixth. He's got plans. It's amazing. And he's cool. And he's inspired. And he's contributing to society. Um, as well as ideas, teaching kids ideas and teaching them discoveries, I also propose this idea that we also need to give kids more opportunities to learn about how those same ideas affect their lives. Because they're going to have to make decisions on things like whether you get your kid vaccinated or all the other decisions for issues that we don't even have yet. And if we don't actually give them the opportunity to, to discuss and to debate these things, then they're never going to have that experience. And they're basically going to really struggle to deal with the challenges and the situations that they're going to face. So I've said loads of stuff today. I've told you all these different things that we could do. I've said, all right, yeah, let's make our kids, let's give them more opportunities to dis discover stuff. I mean, I'm not saying that we shouldn't still teach them some content and all the rest of it, just to address the balance a little bit. I've also suggested that we give kids more opportunity to discuss it all. Um, so why aren't we doing it? And I don't think that's a question just for educators. I actually think it's a question for every single person in this room and, and everywhere else. Because every single person in our community, you, you collectively set the climate for your schools. You decide which school you send your kids to. You, we decide collectively how we decide what a good school is. How do we measure that? And all these different things, they, constrain, they, they provide constraints and set the environment where the school is and, and then determine how it evolves and how it changes. A couple of years back, a, a group of teachers came to see me um, and they wanted to know how the school I was teaching at had so many kids doing senior science. And I said, well, we've got this system. It's a bit complicated. And kids say they want to study science. We say, awesome, and we enroll them. <laughs> and then we find out how we can best cater to their needs and create a course that's suitable to them. And, and to me, that doesn't seem like rocket science. But they said, well, that wouldn't work for us, because if we did that, we'd have to let low ability students do science, which would mean that our, attempt, our achievement data would drop, and then people might take their kids from our school and put them somewhere else. And that's a genuine problem. I'm like, these guys didn't want to do that, and I don't think anybody here thinks that that is just or fair, that to have the top 40% of intellectual kids to study science, and everyone else is sorry, you're a bit thick for this. You know, it's not fair, it's not right. But it's what happens when people judge a school according to achievement data as its main um, thing. And, and you, can, you can drill kids to pass exams, and you can choose which kids do the exams in the first place. And that makes your achievement data look really good. Actually, having an educational outcome is a lot more difficult. You can't drill kids to become the next leaders, the next innovators, the next creators, the, the discoverers and the scientists that we're going to need in the future. So. <clears throat> Thank you. So what we do need to do, though, is we need to make sure that we tell our schools that this is what we want. The schools can actually make this change now. In New Zealand, we've got a very, very flexible curriculum. And despite what a lot of people will tell you, NCEA is also very, very flexible. We can do a lot of personalization to different kids' needs. But we have to tell our schools that that's what we're looking for. 
we have to make them confident that we're actually ready to address that balance between just content knowledge and actually giving kids the opportunity to discover and to deal with those discoveries. So I'm just going to say to you today, next time you're in school for parents' evening, ask your teacher, especially the science teachers, ask them, when does my kid get a chance to discover something for themselves? Flick an email to the principal and, and tell them, this is what you really value. Because I think if you did that, collectively we'd start a movement and we'd put discovery back into the science classroom. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you.